Surveillance video captured the moments two officers approached a blue vehicle parked on 38th Street. I pray that we never become a victim of what George been through. But there needs to be a change. Tension and violence on the rise tonight across Minneapolis and St. Paul over the death of George Floyd. A jury convicted Chauvin on all three charges stemming from the death of George Floyd. We've been praying nonstop, nonstop for this verdict. You changed the world, George. May 25th, 2020 started as another sticky, sunny day in Minneapolis. Then everything changed when Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin held his knee to George Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes outside the Cup Foods at 38th in Chicago, sparking a racial reckoning that echoed across the country. Unrest broke out across the Twin Cities. Buildings, including the 3rd Precinct in Minneapolis, burned. Police in SWAT gear roamed the streets. And even in the first days after Floyd's murder, we were asking, What's next? Sharon Yu brings us a story from 2020, just over a week after Floyd's death. Bringing unity to the community. 89.9 KMOJ, the people's station. KMOJ's call letters come from the Swahili word umoja, which means unity. And in the past couple of days, Zaini K has been in the middle of the community. We are here to listen. Not just as a radio host, but as a therapist of sorts. Last Sunday, we stopped the music uh, for several hours during the day, and we just took calls uh, from community leaders, uh, from listeners. And so you feel that pain, that anguish. I think now what that's going to start to turn to is encouragement like following uh, the special. memorial. With George Joy. Floyd's memorial streaming live on 89.9 FM, Zaney spoke from the heart, okay. reflecting on all the voices he has heard in the past few days. Every night I try to, I try to fight back tears as you know, my work never stops when I leave the radio station. I, I always imagine my son, who is 24, right? I imagine if that was me, uh, you know, and, and so I think that's, a, that's what a lot of people are doing. They're, they're looking at this thing through the filter of what if that was me? What can I do to, to make sure that that's not me or my son moving forward? As one of the figures central to the communication during this crisis, Zaini says he's seen shock and anger now starting to morph into something else. At this moment, we're seeing the intersection of that rage and then that opportunity to change, to really open it up and have these conversations, black and white, opening up, expressing what each other feels. He's not denying that there's anxiety out there that momentum might be lost, about disappointment that came time and time again before George Floyd's death. But as someone behind the sounds of a station that promises unity in the community, he's playing the track of hope. Minneapolis is ground zero, right? It started here and it has sprawled globally. So I think the conversations should start here. And that's why I'm encouraged. And, and the conversations that are going to come out of this are going to be amazing. And I'm looking forward to, and I said this every day on the radio this week, I am hopeful that a real, real change is going to happen in this country starting from now. Sharon Yu, Carol Levin News, Minneapolis. On June 4th, 2020, Shiloh Temple in Minneapolis hosted an official celebration of the life of George Floyd. While the service only lasted a few hours, both those in attendance and those watching across the country hope the memorial's message would have a lasting impact. Boyd Hooper was at the funeral three years ago and brings us the story of the ceremony. Amazing grace. To memorialize is to remember. How sweet. But the service for George Floyd was as much about what's to come. This is the time we won't stop. We gonna keep going until we change the whole system of justice. In an energized 27 minute eulogy, Don't Reverend L. Sharpton time. held up Floyd, who died with the knee of a Minneapolis police officer on his neck as the catalyst for long needed change. George Floyd's story has been the story of black folks. Because ever since 401 years ago, the reason we could never be who we wanted 
and dream to be in is you kept your knee on our neck. Inside, celebrities including Ludacris and Kevin Hart joined civil rights stalwarts, Reverend Jesse Jackson and Martin Luther King III. We going back to Washington, Martin. On the political side, Senators Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith and Governor Tim Walz. Pre-service, St. Paul Mayor Melvin Carter planted a fist on Floyd's casket after Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry became visibly emotional, paying his own respects. Pray for us. Outside, on the grounds of North Central University, several hundred others listened on speakers. Justice for all the world tomorrow. The type of racially diverse crowd of which Sharpton has made note during his visits to the Twin Cities. And when I looked this time and saw marches where in some cases young whites outnumbered the blacks marching. I know that it's a different time and a different season. I'm more hopeful today than ever. Hoping to seize the moment, Sharpton called for a new march on Washington to push for a federal act like those passed during the Civil Rights Movement. This is the era to deal with policing and criminal justice. We need to go back to Washington and tell them this is the time to stop this. Family members shared stories of growing up in Houston's third ward. No washer and dryer, socks washed in the sink and dried in the oven, but a home with abundant love. We would uh, sleep in the same beds. Floyd's brother, Philonis. Play video games together. Cousin, Sharita Tate. The thing that I will miss about him most is his hugs. And younger brother, Rodney. Can y'all please say his name? Thank y'all. Floyd family attorney, Ben Crump. George Floyd is the moment that gives us the best opportunity I have seen in a long time of reaching that high idea that this country was founded on. As the service neared its end, by your heads, attendees stood in silence for eight minutes and 46 seconds, the length of time the officer's knee was on Floyd's neck. But silence is not to be George Floyd's legacy. Go on home, George. Get your rest, George. You changed the world, George. We're going to keep marching, George. We're going forward, George. Time out. Time out. Time out. Boyd Hooper, Carol Evan News, Minneapolis. As the community started to heal following George Floyd's death, some wanted to set aside the place where he was killed as a place for healing. The intersection at 38th and Chicago in Minneapolis was closed to traffic for weeks and a memorial sprang up in the intersection. Leaders of the Agape Movement, a community group that policed the area, shared their plans for the space with Heidi Wigdahl. Since George Floyd's murder, members of the Agape Movement have been at 38th and Chicago. I mean, they put the first barriers. They put it up. Steve Floyd is a co-founder of the nonprofit that aims to bridge the gap between the community and law enforcement. They've been helping provide security in the neighborhood. So we're basically here to establish in this community young men who are ready to take our community back. Their motto is transforming street energy into community energy. Many of them are former gang members now reaching out to those whose shoes they once walked in. They provide programs related to everything from mental health to de-escalation training. Steve says 90% of those they surveyed who work and live in the area want to see the intersection reopen, but safely. We approach the mayor and the chief and say, hey, as a community, we want to do what's right in our own community as far as supporting black businesses, as far as supporting the, the minorities that's in the neighborhood. Agape does have a contract with the city's Office of Violence Prevention related to outreach with at-risk youth and working with staff on violence prevention. But Steve says that's not related to their efforts of reopening the square. Part of me wants it open just because of the stuff that's going on in here so we can try to iron it out. Um, a part of me doesn't want it open just because I believe that this space has evolved into a healing space. We had questions that will allow us to check ourselves and see what we're doing is, is the right thing, but that's okay, that's what we want. 
you know, and the people to give their own opinion about it. They hope by starting the reopening process, more focus can be put on issues like the three children shot, two of them killed. So a lot of people coming with their own agendas and all that. Just, just, just listen to us. We expected to push back, but we still going to push forward. Heidi Wigdahl, CARE 11 News. In May 2022, Minneapolis officially designated the two block area near Cup Foods as George Perry Floyd Jr. Place after a unanimous vote by the city council. In 2021, 15 months after Floyd's murder, a Minneapolis's Longfellow neighborhood still showed scars from the burning of the Minneapolis Police Department's third precinct and other businesses in the area. But at the former site of Minnehaha Liquors, artist Angela Two Stars wove an installation called the Transition Stage, made up of messages from the community. Ken Erdahl tells her story. As part of just the community being able to come back together and reflect after everything that happened last year and all the destruction and devastation and trauma that occurred, it's again a new metaphor for the community in this transition stage change that they're experiencing and then they're going to be, you know, rebuilding healthy, like, you know, as a butterfly would come out of a cocoon. I can't help but notice outside of this cocoon right now, there's some outlines yeah. and it looks like from above, mm -hmm. it looks like a butterfly. That's right, yeah. It's hard to imagine how much this very lot has changed just from a year ago. It was a really, a uh, really difficult time. And I think that's something that the community can really attest to. And that's what this art piece is meant to really reflect is the voices of the community that's creating this art piece. Today, we feel much better. Ruhel Islam is one of those community voices. His restaurant, Gandhi Mahal, was one of 11 locally owned businesses that were damaged or destroyed in this two block area during the riots. We have our made in Minnesota curry plant, curry pot that we grow here. He has long term plans to rebuild here and has opened his land as a community space and garden in the meantime. We're growing food because we believe in tomorrow. When you look around Longfellow right now and look back to the time following the third precinct burning, you can see very easily what has changed quickly. The Target, the AutoZone, the Wendy's, that bounced back very quickly. Over here where we're standing, it is very empty. Why is that? The Wendy's and Target, they have their architectural design already set up. What are we gonna build? We're gonna build 21st century building here. So it's not gonna be the same thing. It's almost, almost like a restarting our life. In fact, he says it took a year to simply demolish his building and get to this point. But he's now partnering with Pangea World Theater on a multi-year plan to build a restaurant and theater while connecting to the land through a greenhouse, solar garden, and seed bank. It's not easy, but it's not impossible, you know. My main thing is keep everyone united, that we can make it happen. No matter what happened, we have to be very positive. We have to be keep calm and carry on, right? Keep calm and move forward. Yesterday was yesterday, we're working today for better tomorrow. And like the cocoon next door, it's growth worth waiting for. And really having an opportunity to reconsider what are we going to rebuild? How are we going to rebuild? What's gonna be different? What's gonna be better? While the cocoon is no longer there, the messages that formed its woven walls helped inform groups like Longfellow Rising, a nonprofit formed to help business owners in their work towards redevelopment. While Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd, he and three other officers were fired from the Minneapolis Police Department within the week. The conversation around what role the police department should play going forward was brought to the local and national stage for discussion. Some on the Minneapolis City Council called for the police to be defunded or abolished, but not everyone agreed. In 2023, nearly three years after Floyd died, Gordon Severson took a look at how a brutal murder in Memphis echoed with what happened here in Minneapolis. First thoughts was uh, not again. How does this keep happening? Minnesota State Representative Cedric Frazier says change is often one step forward and two steps back. He's seen that firsthand at the Minnesota State Capitol. We've seen some changes. We've seen some policies put in place to address some issues and, and maybe have more accountability. Um, but the fact of the matter is these situations keep happening. And when they happen, he says it's easy to feel a sense of defeat. But it's important to remember that some things have changed, like new policies and laws passed at the state capitol, the restructuring of the Minneapolis Police Department, 
and their new police chief. I've heard him speak to the, the trauma that's been caused to the community and, and the desire to want to reconcile and, and restore and try to build some trust in our community. I think that's important. But when we talk about Minneapolis, what we're doing, we're progressing. Al Flowers with Minnesota Safe Street says the community now has a stronger voice when it comes to managing their police department. The Police Community Relations Council is now meeting once a month and Flowers feels the police department is taking the community's feedback seriously. And we got to show an example here in uh, Minnesota that we are, that we're working with our police department. Uh, is it where we want it to be? No, that's, what, that's why it's a work in uh, progress. Flowers says he is horrified by what happened down in Memphis, but he's also worried that it could distract from the progress that is being made here in Minnesota and the work that still needs to be done. I got to keep telling our community, no, we got to move forward. You got to lead our people uh, in, in our community in the right way. And the right way is to continue to try to uh, build this relationship the Minneapolis City Council is working to create a 15-person community commission on police oversight. The civilian group will have oversight of MPD practices, policies, and complaints against officers. Several activists and community groups have spoken out against the new structure, saying it's not enough of a change and lacks real authority. Officials said earlier this month that a comprehensive report detailing the possible future of the 3rd Precinct building is expected in June. The younger people in the Twin Cities were impacted by Floyd's murder, just like their parents and their neighbors. In 2021, Heidi Wigdahl told the story of a group of Minneapolis high school students trying to come to terms with the changes they saw happening around them. Speak up and stand by the communities who need it. For the past year, as people protested racial injustice, the youth have been front and center. We're showing the schools that our lives matter for the education right now. Speaking their minds. When they like kill one of us black people, because as a black person, they can't trust police officers to uh to come out and protect us as they say they're gonna do. Xavier Douglas, an eighth grader at Hiawatha College Prep, says after George Floyd's murder, his teachers talked to them about what happened. Yeah, yeah, it helped, it helped. Yes, counselors reached out to students to just make sure everyone was being like had the resources to cope with everything. Nora Francois, a Minnetonka High School senior, says education around this historic moment is important. For students to have accurate descriptions of these events is so important for the future generations to understand how George changed the world. The youth are now helping plant seeds for growth and change. These issues are so apparent in our lives that there's no longer um, a way we can separate um, social justice or what's going on in the world to our work, our school, and our personal lives. Liz Balsoni, a sophomore at St. Catherine University, says mental health has also become a priority. A lot of times those are things we aren't comfortable talking about in a classroom setting, in a workplace, and that just can't be the case anymore because we can't Without our best, healthiest, and um, most empowered selves, we can't be productive. The nonprofit The Real Minneapolis has spent the past year supporting kids through its Hope Youth Center. And allowing them to be free and open and talk about their feelings, but also to be able to run around outside and just be a kid. It's so important right now. Co-founder Valerie Quintana says they'll be offering a free summer program for kids ages eight and up. This is the beginning and we need to just keep doing the hard work. Now that our, our community has seen justice, we have a taste for it now and we're not gonna stop fighting for our brothers and sisters who have lost their lives. We just gotta, we just gotta hope and just keep, our, just keep praying. Little children were also affected by the murder, including Judea Reynolds, who was only nine when she was one of the people to witness George Floyd's death outside of Cup Foods. She and her cousin, then 18-year-old Darnella Frazier, were walking to the store to buy candy. Two years later, Judea has published a book, and her journey is a story in itself. Kaya Edwards shares the story behind the book, A Walk to the Store. <laughs> The smile of an 11-year-old girl at the hair salon for the first time. She going fast as Sonic. A break, perhaps, from being sad. One time I was to be happy and then make myself cry for some reason. Really. It makes me get all my sadness out. Judea Reynolds was nine when she and her cousin Darnella Frazier walked to Cup Foods to buy candy, but instead witnessed George Floyd die. 
Darnella recorded the cell phone video that would go viral as Judea stood by her side. I had dreams about it. My heart started pumping fast. Yeah, sometimes I'm like, I'm going to die. And I still got this pain today. About a month before the day that changed her life and ours, nonprofit Urban Ventures gave Judea a new book. It was about a girl with autism named Cameron going to school for the first time. We are not represented in children's literature. Cameron's mom, Shaletta Brundage, wrote the story that ended up in Judea's home. She remembers that she's got this book with this little black girl who looks like her with little twisty curls on the cover. And so she takes the book to her mama and she says, I want to tell my story. I want to write a book like Cameron. I was like, wow, I want a book too. I would have did a say like her. Judea's mom didn't know Shaletta, but found a way to reach her. Now, about two and a half years later, Judea is the author of A Walk to the Store. I was like, wow. The book intentionally avoids illustrations of Floyd's death, and the tone is more hopeful than sad. Several pages show how Judea's parents helped her cope with what she witnessed. There are also professional tips in the back for other families dealing with trauma. Walk up and step up, get out your shyness. And that's what my mom told me, so I had to get out my shyness, step up and walk up, be a big girl. A big girl with a book and a new friend. The same person who drew my pictures is the same person who drew Judea's pictures. Cameron of Cameron Goes to School. We both had challenges, like I couldn't talk and she saw him get killed. To watch Carol Evans' complete coverage of George Floyd's legacy, including the trial of Officer Derek Chauvin, go to carolevan.com slash George Floyd. Thank you for joining us.